Now, this is what uh, 1 Timothy 3 says, verse 15. This is the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. There's just one message sent to the church. And this is what Paul writes about the church. But the church has done much more in this, in, in, in our contemporary times or in the previous times to obscure the truth of God and to, to blur it, to obscure it from well-meaning people, believers who had just come to the faith, faith in Jesus Christ. So today, I just came out of a sermon that was a discussion about the person of the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit is extremely clear in the scriptures. Now, this is the Bible, but you know, to some people, it is just a block, a book of text. To some people, this is just paperweight. To some people, this is it, you know, it's worth nothing. It's it, it, it does not have any power, you know, and to other people, it is about themselves. This book is about how I can get my this thing, that thing. It's about how I can claim my blessing. It's about how I can find a godly life partner, find a, you know, get a car. You know, I, I've said in a sermon where Ephesians 1 3 is interpreted, the spiritual blessing is interpreted as the future car that I would have, the future condominium that I'll live in. And I'm like, looking back, wow, where is the truth in all things? We, we swerve one degree away from the narrow way and absolutely throw away the truth. We might as well do that. We might as well throw out our Bible. We might as well throw our brains. We might as well throw out the Holy Spirit that was so that costly Holy Spirit that was given to us through the death of Jesus. The Spirit is an is an inheritance to us because someone died. Someone died so that we can receive this inheritance. And it has been interpreted that this spirit is. You know, we use it to justify so many of our own interpretations, like whether it be praying in tongues, when there are a few loose verses here and there. It's about my comfort. It's about my pleasure. It's about my whatever. And we look at every time when Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit and we cross compare my pastors talk about it. And it's so different. It is so different. Now, I'm not going to just talk about this out of the blue because scripture has been always our anchor, right? I mean, obviously, at a certain point, I use scriptural promises to, to justify some of my doctrine and all of that. Um, and and uh, it, it's obviously erroneous, right? but you know, when we know and identify an error, is why do we continue? Why do we continue? Now let's look at what the Bible tells us about the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1. The Holy Spirit promised since verse 4. Which he said, you have heard from me, Jesus, when John truly baptized with water, 
but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. What's this power for? What is what is this power for? So that you can feel powerful, so that you can run a, a multi-million dollar ministry, so that you can be rich in this life, or so that you can go around healing people and, and doing good works only? Well, let's look at what the verse says and let it speak for itself. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, why do I refer to Acts chapter 1? It's because Acts chapter 1 actually sets the tone for the entire book of Acts. It is the prologue. It is the opening speech. It is the, those are the last words of the Lord before he ascended. Don't you think that before someone leaves us, they will say the most important thing that um that they that somebody wants us to know, like what are your father's last words to you? Would they, would they not be the most important stuff that this person would report to you? Would they spare? Would they say this in vain? Would they say this for nothing? No, from then on, it was about doing the will of God and not just what I want, what I need, what are my, what is my solution out of my problem. It's, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. God wants to take our eyes away from ourselves and look to him only. It is, there is no second chance. There's no second way about this. It is, the gospel is about God. And then, that's when you come to Acts chapter 2, and a lot of people use this to justify, you know, praying in tongues and all that. We see that in verse 4. It's true. But what happens later on? The prophecy that Jesus spoken was fulfilled. Joel chapter 2 quoted here. But later on, Peter, being moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke to them. Jesus of Nazareth. He says, man of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, having crucified and put to death. It's about his death. It's about his resurrection. Because later it says God raised him up. It is about the prophecy that Jesus fulfilled, that he is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is he is the, the one that God, the only way that God has chosen by which man must be saved, by which man's sin can be taken away, atoned for, once and for all. And you will see that there's another famous verse in Acts chapter 4 where it says there is no other name. There is no other name under heaven by which man must be saved. And so, why are we going on and on again? about your needs, my needs. It is about the kingdom of God has come. God has proclaimed the good news. I don't even need to read a commentary to see this. I don't need to read a scholar. I just have to, I just have to read the Bible word for word to see it. This is what Jesus says, unless one is born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. Which begs the question really, why uh, born again pastors, why are born again preachers not talking about the kingdom of God? It's a, it's a un very, very unfortunate, it's a very unfortunate malaise in the part of the church that, and I'm not just talking about my church, as the whole of Christ Christendom, there is just this 
slowness, uh, dullness towards what God actually is trying to speak to us. And you will see that actually Peter wrote that in his own epistle when he said that they had the prophetic word confirmed, which we would do good, do well to heed as a light that shines in dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. God, he, Peter is setting the tone for this. The prophetic word is not just any prophetic word that you like to release anything, any, you know, chin chai word that you want to give. It is, it is the prophetic word of God. That there is no prophecy with private interpretation. The interpretation is the Holy Spirit. is Spirit given. You are not obliged to give a private interpretation or personal interpretation. What do what do reform? What do Protestant Christians mean when they say that they are sola scriptura? It is not that oh, does the Bible say can I do this? Does the Bible say I cannot do that? No, it is that we are bounded. Scripture holds the highest place in our life. It should be the testimony. It should be our testimony and lives uh, as Christian, as people who are children of God, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. And once again today, another verse that was called Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 16. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Yes, of course. To whom? It, you can't be a son of God apart from Jesus Christ. This has to be, this cannot be passed over. You know, I'm going to be a child of God. Yes. But in whose name? You have to acknowledge there is only one begotten son. There is only one adoption. There is only one means by which men are adopted into the faith. If you want to be called Christians, you have to bear his name. You cannot be a child of God apart from his name. This is about Christ. This is this chapter itself opens up. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It is in Christ Jesus. It is not about you. It is not about you. It is about Christ Jesus. Something that I don't understand. I don't understand how you can go about a sermon talking about the person of the Spirit without actually referring to what the Bible tells us about the Spirit. And you know, if it's a first year Bible student, yes, pardonable. Second year Bible college student, yes, pardonable. A uh, pastor, a uh, holder of a master of divinity. What is going on? What is going on? It is in. Christ Jesus. The Spirit is not given apart from Jesus Christ. It was by His will. By His will. The, we are not praying in the Spirit by our own will, you know. It is something that's done in the will of God. It's a very big difference. It's a very big difference. And that's why there are people who can tell me that they're in Christ, but they don't know Christ. That's ridiculous. You can't. That's when you have a very loose theology of salvation. Salvation is based on, I made a confession. Oh, I said it. God must save me. I've ever met a person living in perpetual sin who actually declared that, um, that I've got to be saved. I got to save me. right? Like, yeah. Because I made a confession some many years ago. And and continue to live a lifestyle of sin, and continue to endorse a lifestyle of sin as a child of God. Paul would. Paul, that wouldn't fly with Paul. 
That wouldn't fly, James. You would say that faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Faith without good fruit is dead. You're constantly feeling all these loose sermons. Don't have, not grounded like Second Timothy. Don't you realize even Paul himself is bounded by authority to preach the word of God simply with simplicity when he declares that the church is the house of God and we ought to conduct ourselves in the house of God the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. And he goes on and he declares the same thing. It's the same thing. It's the same thing that the Holy Spirit is supposed to kind of declare. He is supposed to testify of the crucified, the, 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 the incarnate Christ who was crucified, who was died, who was buried, who was resurrected. There's nothing complicated about the Bible. There's nothing, pers it's not, it's not a word of man. You know, it is not my devotional book. It is the word of God. It, it carries the authority. It carries the authority. If we don't give people the, the truth, they won't have, they will never have the authority. They will never understand. And then you have these people doing signs and wonders under what authority? Under what authority? Under what spirit? If you can preach the Holy Spirit without preaching Christ, Without telling about how he how he lived, how he was incarnate, how he humbled himself. Look, let's let's even go there. <clears throat> there's not one, there's not one, almost not one epistle that that stops proclaiming the gospel. Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, being the form of God. Do not consider it robbery to be equal with God made himself of no reputation, coming in the likeness of men, found in the appearance as a man, humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. It's so intentional that he, Paul, suddenly declares about his incarnation, his life, death, crucifixion, and resurrection. There is no other way, there is. And look, we can fact check. I mean, just cross cross check whatever I said. And see if I've, I've lied at any point. And as I said, we can go 1% off north, the true north, and we won't reach the true north at the end of the day. And that's in that context, in all of this context, that is where Matthew 7, where Jesus was saying, enter by the narrow gate. I used to like this verse and I trembled, I feared, because I'm like, wow, my life of sin, constant domination by sin, is not a line, is not, a, puts me really afraid of judgment day. When he says enter by the narrow gate, enter by the narrow gate. As for there is no other thing under heaven. You're either walking in the narrow way or you are walking in the way of the majority. The way of this world. I mean, worldly church. Enter by the narrow gate. And that really sets the, the tone for I didn't say these words. I'm quoting point blank, quoting verbatim. These are the words of Jesus Christ himself. Why aren't we getting people in that way? Why are we doing as what? The what Jesus warned the scribes and the Pharisees not to do. Why are we preaching all these? Why are we shutting the kingdom of heaven against men? 
as one who does not go in ourselves and also not allowing others to go in. This absolutely irks me. It's, it's the message all the way from the start. Genesis. Then after that, um, the Exodus, and then the books of Moses. Moses came and he warned the children of Israel how to turn aside from the Lord. Joshua tells the people, don't turn aside from the Lord. Then the prophets came, and then they were saying, look, we're following the ways of the Lord, we're offering the sacrifices, we are putting our faith in, in the Lord, we're putting our faith in Yahweh, and the, the prophets rebuked. Then look at Jeremiah, what he got for, for, all, his, for all his words of truth. Everyone only knows how to quote Jeremiah 29.11. But you know what Jeremiah said to do at the beginning of his ministry? Said to rebuild the children of Israel. He says that they have gone far from me, follow idols. He said, I will bring charges against you. That there is an indictment. And I'm not trying to, to, to just blow up, you know, all the negative parts of the Bible. But have we seriously looked at this book for what it is? Because it because there's a lot of bad news inside. There's a lot of bad news. And bad news is that and that this is not even unique to the Old Testament. We go into Thessalonians. Okay, you go into Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship. So he sits as God in the temple of God, showing that he himself is God. But have we read the word of God? What it is? Or are we just going there, you know, like Marcion with, the, with his knife and we're just using scissors and we're like, okay, I'm going to cut out this phrase. Oh, this verse looks nice to me. I'm going to put it as my screen saver. I'm going to put it as my wallpaper. Obviously, there's hope here. We are bound to give thanks for you always because God from the beginning chose you for salvation, for sanctification by the Spirit and believe in the truth which He called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do not doubt when I say this most churches have strayed from this commandment and have not shown themselves qualified to inherit to inherit the kingdom of God. There is all these warnings again and again. You know, one thing I just decided to flip through the book and to look at all the most of the headings of different chapters. And the heading is a very good summary of the whole counsel of the word of God. It gives us an idea of what the word is trying to tell us. I came to agree that a lot of the, the things that we see in contemporary Christianity 
do not reflect the literal sense of what God is trying to speak to us. It is, yeah, it is a watered down. It is a, every church will say this, don't go to a church that's watered down, but they themselves water down the message. So there's a lot of hypocrisy, isn't it, on that part. When you're telling people that we are the ones preaching the, the truth of God, and and by this truth you can hold, and through this truth you can see the Lord. Through this truth you can obtain righteousness from the Lord. Have you read about the righteousness of God? Have you read about the holiness of God? Have you read about the, the bar that he sets? It's not an ordinary bar. It's not attainable at all. Not with our greatest strength. Not with our greatest intellectual knowledge. Not. It really is as extreme as what Jesus says. Unless one is born of God. Born again. Completely born again. We just have this very, very loose theology when it comes to church. That, that either, you know, we, we, we well, preach either holiness, we preach grace, you know, preach grace, you can preach holiness, you got to balance it, all that. And uh, no, it is the whole thing, you know, or you choose to preach grace, truth, truth, grace, you've got to balance it. We've got to give it as a whole. And not loosely. Right? The, the law came to Moses, uh, the grace and truth to Jesus Christ our Lord. That is that is his, the, the introduction that, that John gave about when he saw Jesus Christ. He is um suddenly the merciful lamb that, that came to be propitiation for our sins. But if you do not know, even know what sin you committed, how are you going to be propitiated for? You don't even tell people that they have to confess their sins. That they have to, they have to receive Christ by faith. That despite being sinners, despite having sin in them, they have to, they have to come to terms with true human condition as the Bible talks about it. And it's not a positive, it's not just a positive confession kind of book, you know. So that is, so I guess, all for now. It's not the entirety of the, the whole burden that I have, um, but. I guess to just conclude by saying that there's, there's just two ways that we can, or like there are many ways that we can look at this book. There are people who call Jesus the supreme, like uh, spiritual master. They are like, see Jesus coming to teach them, you know, about the art of Zen and the universe and all those things. And I'm like, it's that the Jesus that I read in this Bible, because you know, we can go aside from it. There's a few ways we can treat this book. We can treat it as the word of God. And let it speak to us as is. You know, accept it at face value. Everything that it tells us about the truth. Or we can reject it. And, um, or, we can, or we can accept part of it. And mix in our denominational traditions. We can mix in some... Uh, personal interpretation, you can mix in anything, anything but you, Holy Spirit, anything but what exactly you came here to tell us. It doesn't seem like the Holy Spirit came here to talk to us about unicorns and um and uh, you know rainbows and unicorns and marshmallows and cotton candies. Or, or you can accept that, that's, that that your version of the Holy Spirit is just very, very, very different from, from the Holy 
to when this word about God's holiness was mentioned in the Old Testament. It's a very weighty, it's a very heavy word. People die because they were not holy when they walked into the presence of God. And their sacrifice or their heart was not clean. They, they died. The only reason we are not dead is He had mercy on me, He had mercy on you. That's as simple as, as it gets. Right? Um, uh, that's all I can say. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, you, you can take it as like, okay, it's your own personal understanding. But I try as much as I can to quote word for word. It can be the New King James Version. Fine, you, you, know, you flip into another version and see if it's if all the verses talk about uh, similar things. Um, yeah. yeah, this guy, you know, is too, you know, he's, he's so hard on doctrine and all that and stuff like that. He's a Pharisee. Fine, fine. Say what uh, you like, but um, it's presenting the word of God as, as it is through the ages. I don't think you find a contrary message or contrary gospel in the the, the Bible. Well, if you are a serious student of it, then uh, they probably will have many points of agreement about this matter. But otherwise, I'm just another lunatic that uh that is so hard up about so hard up about the way sermons are supposed to be so hard up. Right about how, uh, how how things should be done, and uh, yeah, you can dismiss, you, you could dismiss whatever I have to say, but uh, I proclaim that the the good news as God has intended. There's no, there's no um personal interpretation. There is no. There's only the way that Holy Spirit preaches it. There's, there is no other name. So God bless. Uh, see you next time.